Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the TTEC annual general meeting. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And to do so, we have to ascertain whether a quorum is present. So I now call the meeting to order and ask shareholders to you, well, just order when we're doing things, if we're having any, if we may, when we make any um, points. And when we're, if you have any discussions, to try and use the microphone and to identify yourself. And to remind you that when we're voting or passing resolutions, it's only shareholders who can actually vote and pass the resolutions. So before we start, I'm going to ask John Gibson, who is the Senior IT Security Officer at TTEC, to say a blessing for us. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for bringing us safely here to this gathering of our annual general meeting. We thank you for the organization, TTEC, and what it represents. We thank you for the leadership, members of staff, and you, our shareholders. Bless these proceedings, dear Lord, so that at the end we may declare that they've been successful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, John. It was a point of order to order the first meeting last year. We had skipped that item. So we actually, we see we're a learning organization. We've actually <laughs> listened and learned. Okay, um, next item on the agenda is notice of the meeting. And I'm going to ask a shareholder to propose and another shareholder to second the motion that the notice convened in the meeting, having been previously circulated, be taken as read. Could I have a proposal? Smart, so smart. Seconded by Mr. John Gibson. Thank you very much. And the voting on the resolution. Those in favor? Aye. Any against? Okay, so the resolution has been carried. Apologies. We have two apologies uh, from two of our directors, Mr. Norman Chen and Mr. Gregory Henry both of whom are unable to attend because they're currently overseas. Um, I don't know if there are any other apologies, but Madam Secretary, or Mr. Secretary, <laughs> <laughs> Madam Recording Secretary, Mr. Secretary. No, I received no other apologies, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. My apologies. <laughs> Probably appropriate. Um, have we received any proxies? Yes, sir, we have received four valid proxies. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd just like to do a quick welcome. And again, welcome you all to the meeting. Um, just one item, I don't know if there's some, something I should apologize for. There were a few errors in our annual report and we have done an errata page. And I'd just like to apologize on behalf of the company for that is, you know, we strive not to do, to make errors, and, but once we have made them, we acknowledge them and we correct them. So this is something we have had to do, and again, to the shareholders, I apologize. Um, we have, so, we have a few people that I'd like to acknowledge. We have a few members of the press here. We have our Auditors, Ernst and, Ernst and Young, represented by Mr. Winston Robinson. I'd like to, and Leticia, yes. And Leticia Richards. Our recording secretary, Mr. Yvonne Godfrey, who keeps us on the straight and narrow at our board meetings. Our registrars, who are doing an excellent job outside, the Jamaica Central Security Depository. Um, and in addition, I'd just like to introduce the folks who are sitting at the head table so we know who are. I, for all, am Philip Alexander, I'm the chairman. My immediate right is Edward Teddy Alexander, who is the CEO. His right is Mrs. Hortons Gregory Nelson, who is the finance and admin manager. To her right is Mr. Thomas Chin, who is a non executive director. And to his right is Mr. Christopher Record who is the company secretary and a director 
and his rank is Ms. Joan Murphy Powell, uh, now the non-executive rec director, and her, her rank is Mr. Hugh Allen, who is one of the founding members of the company. Let's point out with Teddy. Okay. Um, so now we're going to get into the... Oh, and I also like to acknowledge Mrs. Lisa Hogarth, or PR person who makes sure everything runs smoothly on days like today. Lisa, thank you very much for everything. Oh, she's a shareholder as well. Fabulous. <laughs> and I'd also like to make a special thank you to the to the um, investing public who has shown a lot of confidence for a company that's basically one year old from a public point of view in that when I looked yesterday afternoon, not today, but I looked yesterday afternoon, our share price closed at $8. And if I remember rightly, when we did the IPO, it was $2.50 a share. So I think I'd like to thank you all for the confidence you've shown in our small, but I think very progressive organization. And I hope you continue to show that into the future. Okay, oh, I forgot Richard. <laughs> Richard, sorry. <laughs> Our mentor who has, you know, done excellent work for us, Mr. Richard Downer. Without him, I think we would have tripped over a few, in, fallen into a few other potholes that we didn't know were on the road. But Richard has kept us, you know, going very well and done an excellent job for us. Okay, um, we're now going to get into the ordinary business of the meeting. And I'm going to ask, first thing is the director's reports and accounts. I'm going to ask the secretary to table the accounts for the financial year ended December 31st, 2016, and the report of the director's hearing. Thank you. I'm going to ask now Mr. Winston Robinson of Ernst & Young, or auditors, to read the excerpts from the independent report of the auditors. You know, Winston? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. I just make draw your attention to pages 31 to 35 of the annual report that uh, indicate the new and amended audit report, which is a much l longer audit report than before. Uh, within the profession, we have been allowed to read excerpts from the report and make reference to other sections, which is what I'll do with your permission. Independent auditors report to the members of T-Tech Limited. Opinion. We have audited the financial statements of T-Tech Limited, the company, which comprise the statement of financial position as at 31st December 2016, the statements of comprehensive income, changes in equity, and cash flows for the year then ended, and notes comprising significant accounting policies and other explanatory information. In our opinion, the accompanying financial statements give a true and fair view of the financial position of the company as at 31st December 2016 and of its financial performance and cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with international financial reporting standards and the Jamaican Companies Act. Basis of opinion, we conducted our audit in accordance with international standards and auditing. Our responsibilities under those standards are further described in the auditor's responsibilities for the audit of financial statements section of our report. We are independent of the company in accordance with the International Ethics Board for Accountants Code of Ethics for Professional Accountants and we have fulfilled our ethic other ethical responsibilities in accordance with the IESBA code. We believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our opinion. Other matter, the financial statements of the company for the year ended 31st of December 2015 were audited by another auditor who expressed an unmodified opinion on those financial statements on the 4th of May 2016. As part of our audit of the 2016 financial statements, we also audited the adjustments described in Note 22 that were applied to amend the 2015 financial statements. In our opinion, such adjustments are appropriate and have been, appro and have been properly applied. 
we're not engaged to audit, review, or apply any procedures to the 2015 financial statements of the company, other than with respect to the adjustments and accordingly, we do not express our opinion or any other form of assurance on the 2015 financial statements taken as a whole. I will just now refer you to the key audit matters section of the report and to highlight the, the one key audit matter. Key audit matters are defined in the report and we have indicated one key audit matter which relates to allowance for credit losses. I'll also draw your attention to the other sections of the report that speak to other information contained in the annual report and our responsibilities in, in that regard. And then the section of our report that speaks to the responsibilities of the board of directors. And then the, the final section of the report speaks to the auditor's responsibilities in respect to the financial statements. And that goes on for about two and a half pages. And finally, the report on the company's act. And the report has been signed by Ernst & Young, Kingston, Jamaica, on the 28th of February. 2017. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Chairman, just a point of order, sir. You know, um, this, this matter is a matter of significant controversy and it's like nothing for a while. Um, the, the, um, the companies act, as I understand it, all the companies act stipulated that the auditor's report must be read. And I presume, and I go back to the old one for, for, for specific purposes. Right. When the new act was promulgated, it repeated it. In fact, I sat on a subcommittee, my recollection is that the suggestion was that should, the reason of it should be taken out. Um, and therefore, if the, after the law says it must be read, and I don't think we can get around it by not reading it. Um, unfortunately, the, the audit report is now elongated, and nobody apparently took that into consideration. Uh, but I, I think, unfortunately, we ought to comply <coughs> with the law. And the law says it must be read, and it must be read in court. I don't know how you can up, um, get around it. the law says. Thank you for the comments, John. Winston, I don't know if you want to. It was on the advice of okay. Winston that we, that we went this route. I don't see we can... And Winston, <laughs> Winston had a reason, so I, I don't know okay. if you want to repeat what... Since it's been raised, it has been a, it has been a discussion item. And, um, it has been discussed at the ICAK, it has been discussed in relation to with the minister. And as, I, as I understand it, they have received guidance and approval from the relevant authorities. Who the relevant authorities? The minister with responsibility and the, and the as I understand it. And, that, and, and I understand it that that approval is actually, has been given in writing. And it is on that basis that we were advised, as all it has been put in the report, that we would do this. That, that is a goal. But, but does the companies have to give the... Does the companies have to give the authority to amend the company's law back to the, to the minister and the... And the I have read just about it, but let's leave it as it is. Let's, let's, I mean, the, the report has been circulated, and that's, I guess, my, John, my problem with it, too, that we take everything as, as read except this report, which doesn't make a lot of sense when you stop and think about it. I understand that point as well, very, very clearly. And we debate. My, sorry. My interpretation of what took place is that the company that originally was written, the original one, was done at a time when the level of literacy, literacy yeah. uh, in the society was far less than it is now. And therefore, it was, the oral tradition was important. Yeah. But the 
you know, that that, that back was not changed in the, in the second act and the remain suggests that it's not something I don't think the minister with all due respect, I don't think they have the authority. Okay. So just arbitrary just change it. Okay. The act I think was changed in time. Yeah. Unless there's some clause and I suspect there's no such clause in it, but it may be also. Well, can, maybe we could move a motion that the, we take the report as read, the auditor's report. You can do that? Let's accept it. Okay. Well. I move that it be accepted. Okay. Mr. Jackson moves a second. record. All in favor? Aye. Anybody against? One person. Yeah. Okay, um, that being done, I now have to propose resolution one, that the auditor accounts for the year ended December 31st, 2016, together with the director's report and the auditor's report, thereon be and are hereby adopted. Can I have a proposal, please? John Jackson. John Gibson. Okay, before we go to the next stage, I'm now going to ask our Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Teddy Alexander, and our Finance and Admin, Admin Manager, Mrs. Hortens, Gregory Nelson, to do two brief presentations on the organization. And when we have done that, we'll then have a question and answer section before we go to the final acceptance of the um, of the report. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me offer my own welcome to this uh, 2017 annual general meeting. Um, my presentation this afternoon, I'll be providing an overview of uh, company's operations in 2016, providing some highlights as well as giving some insights into some of the initiatives that we're undertaking in 2017. And hopefully from that, you'll get a good idea of how your company has been performing and, um, <clears throat> and, and where we're focusing our efforts at this time. Um, my name is Edward Teddy Alexander. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of TTEC. Um, and I'll start my presentation from January 7th, 2016, which I'm sure everyone is aware. Um, on that day, um, you know, it, it was a high point for us because on January 7th, 2016, TTEC became the first Jamaican information technology to be listed on the junior market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And that's something that we are very proud of, uh, the fact that we're the first Jamaican IT company to be listed. Uh, for the year, our performance was strong. Your revenues increased by 25.4%, moving from 223 point, moving to 223.1 million. And our profits also increased uh, by 58.2%. Uh, moving from 24.8 million in 2015 to 39.3 million. A uh, big milestone for us was on December 1st, 2016, when the company celebrated its 10th anniversary, and we had a very nice customer function at the Turnover Hotel. Uh, the photograph that you see there um, shows all the team members who were there at the time, and I can tell you the support from all customers was, re was really very uh, very good, and we're very happy with the turnout that we got, and it was a good occasion. Uh, another high point, um, how did the stock, how did our stock price do? Uh, we listed uh, on January 7th at $2.50, and on December, uh, the last trading day in December, we closed at $5.30. Uh, that's an uh, increase of 112%, so I think it's fair to say that the TTEC stock did perform quite well in the year 2016. Um, how did we do it? Well, um, a lot of it was new customer acquisitions. Uh, the company has uh, some specific services that we provide, which I will be going through and speaking about the performance of those services. Um, but a very big focus over the last couple of years has been um, in growing the company to acquire new customers. Um, 
T-Tech is a company that most of our customers, what we try to do is we try to engage with them on a long-term basis and we have long-term contracts. So it's a recurrent revenue stream that we typically get from our customers um, as opposed to where we do specific projects and it's one-off project revenue. Um, so the customers that we have, I do like to uh, show, uh, what, Chris, what was this slide referred to yesterday? We were at a presentation yesterday. And slide. The what? NASCAR oh, the NASCAR slide. slide. Yeah, apparently NASCAR shows off all the logos. But um, this represents um, not quite all, but a significant number of our customers that we ended 2016. And we're quite proud of the, the, the customers that we have and um, because some of them are quite significant companies. Um, but what do we do? How did we actually achieve that type of growth? It wasn't just by acquiring customers. And what does T-Tech do as a business? Uh, one of the things that we have realized is that when we say to, um, to the public that we provide managed IT services, many people actually don't really understand what we do. So one of the things that I'll be doing now is taking the opportunity to ensure that you, our shareholders, really have a, an appreciation of what we do as an organization. Um, our primary, our core activity is manage the provision of managed IT services. Um, these managed IT services are really a set of services wherein we manage the, uh, the core or the key IT elements of the IT infrastructure for our customers. The, uh, the services that we would provide would cover server network infrastructure management, management of our customers' security services. We also provide service desk or help desk services where end users can call us for support. And within the service desk, we also manage the workstations that, and mobile devices that uh, end users in our customers, uh, that end users in our customer organizations use. Within that, we also tie in cloud backup services, um, and, and, and that is a service that we also offer in its own right. I'll speak to that in a little while. Um, in 2016, one of the things that we did was we introduced a new set or a new suite of remote monitoring and management tools. Uh, the reason for that was that the services that we provide actually can become quite labor intensive. And by introducing new tools, what we have been able to do is increase the efficiency of our operations. Um, that I increase in efficiency means that it takes us a shorter time to onboard new customers. It also means that we are able to resolve problems that our customers may be experiencing more quickly. Ultimately, what that's doing for us is helping us to also improve the customer experience, which is a very, very important part of what we do. In addition to managed IT services, uh, or as a part of the managed IT services, I should say, we provide IT security services. Now, this has been top of mind for a lot of people, especially this week. I think everybody would have been aware of the ransomware outbreaks or attacks that took place, um, hurting primarily um, users, uh, companies in Eastern Europe. However, um, what we are aware is that these uh, IT security is becoming more and more important, um, not just to our customers, but throughout the, the world today. Why? Because the threat or the possibility or the risk associated with uh, a security breach in an organization could be disastrous to a company. It could actually put them out of business, certainly it can shut down operations. At a minimum, it's going to result in a severe disruption of operations and fairly high cost to recover. Um, one of the things, though, is that in Jamaica, unlike uh, first world countries, there actually is no legislation or very little legislation in place that forces companies to adopt um, stringent uh, security measures. There are no standards that have to be met uh, in the world of IT security in Jamaica, nor are there any, is there any legislation that requires customers' data to be protected or the privacy of data to be protected. So one of the things that happens that we have realized is that the market, even though everybody says, yes, we need it, when we actually go to market, 
uh, because there's no legislation forcing organizations to put the security measures in place, they actually uh, hem and haw. Usually the companies sign after they've had a breach and they've had a problem. Um, in countries like the US, there are laws that actually require companies, particularly financial institutions, uh, to have very strict, to meet strict standards and get certification in areas such as uh, PCI, etc. So if you handle credit cards, you have to do something. So one of the things we did in 2016 was we focused very heavily on educating the market to increase the awareness of the importance of IT security. And we did that through conducting a number of seminars with organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, um, the Stock Exchange, um, University of the West Indies, the ISACA Kingston Local Chapter, Jamaica Institute of Engineers, and the um, in SIPs, I can't remember exactly what SIPs is, Insurance Professional um, Support Organization. And <coughs> we also did a few sessions with making presentations to boards and management teams. And there are also articles that we published in the Jamaica Observer um, on a regular basis throughout the course of the year. Through that, what that did was, in addition to playing our part to increase awareness in the society of the importance of IT security, it also meant that we were helping to associate the TTEC brand with IT security. One of the things we realize is that when somebody has a breach, they need to know who to call. So one of the things we want to do is to become that top of mind that if you have an IT security incident, call TTEC. What else do we do? Uh, we're very, very active in the um, cloud services. Um, we actually are a partner with Microsoft, and what we have been doing over the last couple of years is helping companies uh, to migrate their email as well as other services, other applications into the Microsoft cloud. And we also have a partnership arrangement with a company called Asigra. Asigra is actually another Microsoft partner. And it's through Asigra that we are able to offer these cloud backup services. Um, the, the take up and the general demand for cloud services is going to grow. You know, it's a bit of a buzzword. It, uh, everybody, we all, you all hear it, you know, cloud is the future. And it is very true. There are no two ways about it that uh, we are moving into an era where they're going to have very, very few IT servers and so on on site or on customer premises. And most of it is, nearly all of it is going to be in the cloud, as we call it. And we are positioning ourselves to make sure that we can take advantage of that trend and be one of the preferred providers to help our companies with the migration to the cloud. Um, our consulting services started up in, when was it, 2014? Marcel, when did we start? <coughs> 2014. Um, Marcel Smart. Marcel is our <coughs> engagement manager for consulting services. Marcel, I understand. Uh, formerly with Grace Kennedy, and then Marcel actually was formerly with Microsoft Jamaica's general manager before joining us at TTEC. Uh, one of the things we realized was that um, the, the, the managed IT services that we provide, even though we may be a leader in Jamaica at this time, um, like everything else, it becomes uh, competition enters and it becomes somewhat commoditized. So one of the things we did was we decided we needed to focus on and providing some higher value services. Consulting services very much fall into that realm, and we're very fortunate that we were able to have Marcel join us and uh, lead the development of our consulting team. Some of the things that we do provide help companies with their IT strategy. Uh, companies seeking to keep IT in-house, we help them with their, uh, improving this, the management of the IT services. We do a lot of project management work, and we have also helped companies with preparation of IT disaster recovery plans. Um, one of the things we realized, though, was that uh, to develop the consulting services more quickly, we needed to develop methodologies and so on. Um, because in some cases, we do end up with more mature consulting organizations. So to try and um, to get up the, the ladder a lot faster, one of the things we did in 2016 was we entered into a partnership agreement with in the Infotech Research Group. 
Infotech is a Canadian company. Uh, it's an IT research organization, and they are regarded as the fastest or one of the fastest growing IT research organizations in North America. Uh, through Infotech, we have uh, access to the research that they do, we have access to their analysts, we have access to their methodologies, their templates, and so on. And through that, we have been able to uh, accelerate the, the pace with which we have been able to mature our consulting services and uh, helped us a great deal. Um, other thing that we have been able to do with Infotech is that they have a very unique set of surveys that we can offer to our clients and those surveys allow us to um, really check the, call it the health of strategic areas of IT in the organization. So for instance, one of the surveys that we can offer is the, what we call the CEO-CIO alignment and what that will do is that will help us to determine whether what the CEO wants is an alignment with what the CIO thinks the organization should be getting. Uh, it helps ultimately with the prioritization of uh, projects and uh, other initiatives that the organization undertakes. Um, these things are unique. I don't know if anybody is doing it in Jamaica at this time, and certainly we have found um, a lot of interest in this particular area. Um, Voice solutions um, or PBX systems, we do offer that. Um, it is something that we have been offering for a while. It's not a pure service. It actually is currently the only area in which we actually do sell anything physical. One of the things we have tried to do at T-Tech is we have tried to stay away from selling uh, computer hardware or equipment uh, for several reasons. One is that it has become commoditized, so the margins are very, very slim. And there are others, many others who are doing it. So we don't see where we can really add any value to that particular area. Um, the other thing is that uh, anybody who has had to deal with customs understands that Im the importation of physical goods into this country can be a logistical nightmare. And all of these things introduce cost. So what we have opted to do is, by and large, uh, stay with services. However, when it comes to PBXs or switchboards, nobody wants to buy a PBX from one company and then have somebody else implement it. So we actually have partnered with a provider, a manufacturer, a company called Zorcom, and uh, we actually resell their PBXs. Uh, we're able to do it, and we're able to compete quite effectively because um, they have some unique features in their design. Um, but we also, more importantly, it's a very cost-effective systems because they're based on open source, um, open source code. Um, in 2016, we deployed our largest commercial system to date for the Gleaner company, and we have over 400 extensions in use. I see a gentleman here with a Gleaner logo on his shirt, so I can assume he is our customer. Welcome, sir. Um, but there, we have several other customers using our PBXs, a uh, notable one I put there, the Stewart's Automotive Group, several uh, companies throughout Jamaica, several locations, uh, including budget rent a car, automotive art, as well as the actual um, Stewart's companies themselves. And um, one of the things we're able to do is we're able to tie all of these PBXs together so that uh, when you're calling from, say, budget in Mobi back to the head office, it's just extension to extension dialing. For other customers, we do the same, and we're actually even able to achieve that uh, overseas um, so that, let's say, a Grace Kennedy office in New Jersey uh, calling back to Harbor Street, they actually just make an extension to extension call, and it's all perfectly legal. Um, one of the areas that we have focused on in 2016, or I should say it's before listing, but definitely since listing, is uh, improving corporate governance. Um, <coughs> listing on the junior market required us to establish an audit committee and remuneration committee, and those are chaired by Tom Chin and Joan Marie Powell, respectively. Um, in the early course of this year, we also have established our corporate governance committee, uh, and that's going to be chaired by our chairman, Mr. Philip Alexander. And what we're using to guide us through the charter and the establishment of the corporate governance committee is the PSOJ corporate governance guidelines, as well as the stock exchange corporate governance index. 
Um, we have done quite a bit of work, attending workshops, seminars, getting ourselves briefed on uh, what are the, some of the requirements, what the requirements are going to be, particularly with respect to the Stock Exchange Corporate Governance Index. Um, and uh, I think we're well, well prepared to undertake corporate governance in a way that makes sense for us. Um, as a small company with a relatively small board, we can only move so fast and, no, and, and not too fast. And what we have to do is make sure the measures that we adopt and implement are in keeping with the needs of the company and we'll proceed at a pace that we can manage. Um, our board mentor, Mr. Richard Downer, has been of tremendous help to us, particularly as we have navigated our way through, this first, through that first year of listing, um, also the preparation of our audited accounts and so on. Uh, Richard has a tremendous amount of knowledge of all these processes and requirements and so on. And as our chairman said, you know, he has probably helped us to avoid many a pothole during the course of the last um, year or so. Uh, IT, managed IT services may be the core of TTEC, but the real engine of TTEC is our people. Um, what we have in place at TTEC really is a very, very talented pool of young professionals. Um, and we work as a team. I cannot stress that too highly. Um, we have many, many uh, young people in the organization because we have a very vibrant um, uh, internship program where we recruit young graduates and give them an opportunity to learn uh, what IT management is all about. And they are happy to say that all of them who we have taken on have been able to offer full-time employment with TTEC. Um, the majority of our team members are shareholders because one of the reasons we listed in 2016 um, was that we wanted to create the opportunity for all team members to become shareholders. We actually did that at the time. However, one of the things is that we did not um, cater for, at the time we didn't cater for how to make employees join in after the IPO uh, to become shareholders. So one of the things that we are actively working on is the implementation of a share trust. And Joan Marie, our uh, remuneration committee chair is helping me um, with that. And what we will seek to be doing with that trust is to have an entity that has the ability to acquire stocks on the open market and we would in turn be able to offer those shares to employees through incentive or stock option schemes. Where we've gotten to is we're quite advanced, <coughs> sorry, in that the trust deed has been drafted. We have had consultation with other companies who have similar schemes in place. And we also have been in communication with the stock exchange who are quite supportive of this effort. Um, the, the, at this time, we are not contemplating uh, offering new shares, so there's not going to be any dilution of the shareholdings of existing shareholders. So as a result, we will not be required to actually uh, have a, a general meeting to have this approved. If in the future we do have to issue new shares, um, then of course that would uh, trigger the requirement for a general meeting and shareholder approval. Um, other things that we're doing in the way of helping with people and people development, uh, we have started a succession planning program um, so that we can you know, uh, cater for the time when uh, others need to move on or some of us need to move on as well as uh, creating opportunities for younger members to see a path for themselves. That will be tied in with our professional development program or performance management program which we are in, uh, we have started the process of putting that together. Um, TTEC gives back to the community and we give back in a way that we believe is uh, and there's to our team members and that basically we have a very simple philosophy. We support communities that TTEC and our team members are involved in. So for example, TTEC is located downtown 
So we support the initiatives of our fellow downtown companies, um, Grace Kennedy with their 5K run, Digicel with their runs, and so on. And if there are other things happening um, um, that companies are doing in the downtown community, we will support that. Uh, many of our team members, um, they are members of service clubs, um, they're members of churches, or well, many, I think all of us are members of alumni associations. So when there are fundraising events or other activities associated with um, you know, those entities, we always support them. Um, of note, I would also add that you know, um, the Jamaica College robotics team benefits tremendously from TTEC. Um, it's not just financial. One of our team members is actually the coach of the team and he actually is at the statue where he actually was asked to be a judge at the first world championships uh, earlier this year. Uh, so we're happy that you know Gavin Samuels, that person, um, is a member, is um, a member of the TTEC team. Um, we also support causes that our customers support. So that is our way of giving back at this time. In the future, uh, that may change. Uh, we could very well get on to the point where we establish a foundation, and that foundation would have one or two specific causes that it would in turn support. Um, so we will um, get to that point in due course. Uh, one of the things that uh, an IT organization has to do is it has to, um, it has to be innovative. Uh, IT is changing the way how the world works, it changes the way how we live, it changes societies. However, it also means that the underlying technologies that we work with uh, change dramatically and the types of services that we provide have to change as well if we are going to remain current and relevant. So one of the things that we are doing is you know, we are reviewing a lot of our existing services to see how can we repackage them so that they become more attractive to the market. Um, other things that we are doing is we are looking to see if we can introduce some innovative financing for our customers. Um, Right now, whenever we, in many cases, when we go into an organization for the first time, there's a bout of what we call remediation necessary because they may have obsolete equipment um, or they may have equipment that's not, not suitable for the commercial environment they operate in. Uh, so one of the things that we do is we actually go in and uh, we recommend that they upgrade the equipment. Sometimes at capital expenditure, they're not willing to make it. Uh, so what we're trying to do is try to find a way to make the, the financing of that capex more attractive so that we'll proceed. When they proceed with that capex, then it means that it's easier for us to get the managed services going with them. Um, we are exploring some other opportunities. There's a document management system in Canada that we're looking at right now. We're also talking with some of the traditional vendors who sell equipment um, while we may not have an interest in selling equipment ourselves, there are services associated with the installation, deployment, and management of that equipment. So we're seeking to see if we can become one of the preferred service providers. And there are international opportunities that come to us. Um, there are companies who we have, I wouldn't say partnerships with, but we have associations with. They work regionally. And sometimes they actually come to us and say, Tite, can you do this? And um, in many cases, we'll say, yes, we can. So we actually are, we are exploring some of those opportunities to provide our services um, outside of Jamaica through that mechanism, through that medium. Whether so, you're in the business. Oops, sorry. What do we do? All right. Um, what we have done is we have created a little animation ad. Uh, which was actually done by a uh, young entrepreneur who is sponsored to attend a conference in Montego Bay in December last year. And this, uh, I'm going to be closing with this little animation because we believe that it really just says very succinctly what T-Tech does for our customers. Whether you're in the business of car sales, fast food, or insurance, technology is vital to your operations to collect data, to communicate, to deliver. But are your IT resources able to focus on strategy and growth? 
What happens when a server crashes at your office? The IT team is busy fixing, but you can't process inventory or client data. So while you wait, the business suffers. And time is money. As a car owner, you wouldn't ignore your vehicle's performance until it breaks down with you on the road. You would have it serviced regularly to guarantee your engine is always running at its optimum. In your business, technology is the engine that grows your company. And T-Tech keeps it serviced. At T-Tech, we manage customers' IT infrastructure to detect and fix issues before they become problems. This allows your IT team to focus on managing important data and applications for growth. For an affordable monthly fee, we'll provide management, monitoring, technical support, and full problem resolution so you stay productive. Want to grow your business? Call T-Tech today. Um, another thing we're doing is we're just refreshing how we uh, promote the actual services that we offer. Um, so an example of a flyer that's being developed at this time and should be finalized in the next couple of weeks. Uh, what's our outlook? Um, w companies are increasing, or organizations are increasing their use of information technology. Um, it's not going to stop. Um, for T-Tech, you know, the year has not started quite as we expected, it's a little flat, um, but we, the demand for our services is very, very strong. Um, the companies are calling us, asking us to come in and help them. Um, during the course of this week, we actually had companies that called us because they had problems trying to mitigate the risk associated with this ransomware, uh, so we actually had to do some um, CPR work on a client um, last night. Um, but some of the other things we're focusing on is that we still have some foundation work to do to manage uh, and the growth that we expect to experience. So we are constantly trying to improve our internal processes and efficiencies. We will execute on some of those new opportunities that we deem to be viable and we're going to continue to develop our people. Uh, the professional development program that I spoke about earlier is very important to us. The other thing that's very important to us is continually finding ways to improve the customer experience. Uh, we have a saying in T-Tech that what we strive to do is we strive to deliver to our customers an insanely good customer experience. And that is something that we actually hold. It's a, a bit of a mantra inside the organization. It's become part of our DNA. Uh, even from when you know, new recruits on board in that first week, they come away. If they remember nothing else about T-Tech, they'll remember that what we aspire to do is to deliver an insanely good customer experience. Um, and in Jamaica, that certainly is sadly lacking. I'm sure we're very welcome when we do achieve it. And improving corporate governance. You know, growth cannot be unmanaged. It cannot happen without making sure that the proper controls and measures are in place uh, to ensure that um, everything is being looked at, everything is being looked after properly, particularly the finances. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. But in closing, I'd just like to thank my colleague directors and executives and the team members of TTEC whose combined efforts have made 26 such a memorable year for T-Tech. I also want to acknowledge and thank our customers for their continued support. And I will say that, in my view, T-Tech has a bright future. We are a young company, and we will have our ups and downs. But I'm confident that our prospects are bright, and our long-term potential is yet to be realized. Thank you. Good afternoon, shareholders and visitors. We will now present the, the financial highlights for 2016. First, we begin with a note. There was a change in auditors and our management conducted a review of its accounting policy, following which amounts were restated for the 2015 balances. Full disclosure is provided in note 22 of the financial statements. We first have a view of our overall our financial highlights. In 2016, our revenues grew by 25.4% over 2015. 
This growth in 2016 was ably assisted with the widening of our customer base, with business from new customers contributing to about 11% of our overall revenues. Our revenues which consist of recurring service contracts and projects. The net effect was an increase in net profit attributable to shareholders of 58.2% with an earnings per share growth of 19.4, which moved from 0 0.31 cents to 0 0.37. So we can see that our revenue performance for the years 2012 up to 2016 have seen consistent growth. The net effect, sorry, so our expenses also increased by 27.3% as well as our talent pool grew by 38% and this was in response to the increased demand for our services. And to support the growth in demand for services, we invested in our talent pool and tools to support our service delivery and increase our efficiency. So of this total spend of our operating expenses, which increased by 27.3%, 58% of this amount was invested in our people. Now I look at our net profit performance. As we can see, our net profit has consistently grown over the period under review. Our balance sheet remains strong, with growth in assets of 13.7%, and this increase is driven by growth in services, and this is reflected in the accounts receivable primarily and the government securities are stated in the accounts. Our liabilities during this time decreased by 24.9%. However, the shareholders' equity increased by 26.4%, and this overall increase in assets and shareholders' equity is refre reflects in our increased profit position. T-Tech, ladies and gentlemen, remains debt-free. The growth in revenues that we see resulted in an increase in our accounts receivables position. The IFRS, on the IFRS, it requires us to make a provision for items older than 90 days in our accounts. Our balances are stated in the financials represents only 8% of this balance. Management made a provision in this year for the amounts in their accounts. We're currently managing the portfolio, we monitor, we have no disputes regarding any of the amounts. We continue to collect and maintain dialogue with our customers regarding these balances. Our growth in revenues over 2015 also resulted in increased shareholder value, and this also follows a dividend payment in September 2016. Our investments have increased from the cash generated from our operations and the net result was an increase in our cash position at the end of the year 2016. We now look at our, our movement in share price. We recognize that confidence in the company remains strong and our balance sheet remains strong. The interest in the company continues to be high with demand for our shares continuing to impact our base in growth of shareholders from approximately 340 when we went to market with our IPO to over 450 at 31st March 2017. Our share prices since going to market continue to provide value to its owners with our share price closing yesterday at $8 from a market initial market price of $2.50. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue to strive to growing our shareholder value and providing an insanely good customer experience in the delivery of goods and services to our customers. Thank you.
now going to open the floor for discussions, questions. Um, can you just, when you have a question, just come to the microphone, state your name, and we will strive to answer, endeavor to answer the questions. And there I have two questions and then two cautionary tales. Um, I was wondering, the project management that you do, are you farming out um, the people who do it? Like, is it becoming virtual now, or are your project managers all in-house? Yeah, yeah, and the other one is, did you hire your securities man yet? The man who, you, there, were, there had been some, you had said in your last meeting that you were, you were looking to find a securities person. I wanted to know if you found a um, technical securities person. And these are two true stories of mine regarding technical stuff that I'm asking everybody to pay serious attention to. One is with GMMB, and if you are involved with GMMB, you could encourage them on this. When I make a transaction online, it automatically sends my whole of my data to my hot mail, and I have no control over not having that data sent to my hot mail. They say that they're, I have raised it with them, and they said that they're in the following months or so that they will be correcting that, and we have the option of not having this default function, but it's not right. The other one with this one is remarkable. I I'm with the Fidelity Investments in the States. And they have consistently screwed up the addresses with the checks coming to me. So I put all of this on the web because they weren't paying attention to me. And I have this customer section on the website that says, you know, this is highly um, encrypted and hosted and covert and it's a private message, this and that. Well, when I went to get one of their messages, my entire message account had been erased. Nobody knows why up to now. I've sent them a letter two weeks ago. They can't explain it. All of the data that I put on Facebook, on all the media, describing and showing what had happened to these checks has suddenly been blurred out. But by some remarkable thing, none of my actual accounts have been changed or troubled. The actual account you know, balances and so are unaffected. So. Tell me how that go in a something, a banking system the size of fidelity. Tell you. Thank you, Susie. Um, I I think I, I would have to be very cautious how I comment on uh, the GMMBs <laughs> or fidelity <laughs> thing, but uh, suffice to say, I'd encourage you to continue speaking with those financial institutions. Um, and also, you know, I think what you have said really just highlights the importance of us getting in place legislation and so on with relation to protection of information, particularly personal information of consumers. Um, in, you know, it, it, it's right now, uh, I don't think anything is really in place. So consumers' rights could actually be abused by virtue of companies collecting information and then not not treating it with the correct uh, levels of confidentiality. And they could share it with others who you don't want it to be shared with, and so on. Um, regarding the questions, project management and, and security person, um, on the security side, our security team is led by John Gibson, John who led us in prayer. Uh, and by the way, prayer is not how we manage security. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my, it doesn't hurt, but that's really not our primary form of defense. Um, but uh, John is our leader on IT security. He has a string of certifications behind his name. Um, so we're very confident in terms of our lead. But we have also recruited a few other young people who have joined the team, and their focus is security. Um, we actually have, um, <clears throat> I mentioned his name, Gavin Samuels, uh, the robotics team, but he actually uh, has been very busy this week um, helping to patch uh, customers' computers that were vulnerable to the ransomware that has been floating around. And we have others on the team. And I think it's fair to say that all members of TTEC are highly aware of the need for security, and all members of the service desk team even though security may not be their primary focus, they actually all um, have um, 
call it incidents that they do manage with respect to antivirus systems and so on. So it, it is very, very, I think very well, um, we're, we're well served in that particular area. Uh, with respect to project management, um, Marcel heads that team and what we, we actually do have an in-house project manager full time, but what we do is we actually have a pool of subcontractors. These are experienced uh, Jamaican person, um, uh, experienced IT personnel who are Jamaican professionals and they work with us. Some are on retainers with us, others work with us on a project by project basis. Um, but through that, we're able to, you know, have a pool of resources available to us, and it also means that, you know, we, we can manage the cost associated with uh, the availability of that pool of resources. Yeah, and here that's in Jamaica or in foreign parts? Uh, here in Jamaica. Okay. Here in Jamaica. Um, some of the projects we actually are able to do quite a bit of the work remotely. Um, but there are certain project management activities that really require on-site face-to-face meetings from time to time. But you know, once you have gotten to a certain point in the project and it has some momentum of its own, it doesn't require every meeting to be on-site. It doesn't require 20, uh, you know, constant presence of the project manager on-site. Okay. Sorry, just a comment on security. A follow-up to what Teddy said, just to let you know, our first corporate governance activity uh, this month, earlier this month was to actually do a sensitization training session with the board on cyber security so that we are all aware of what is happening out there and how we personally can defend ourselves and defend the company and how the company is going about ensuring that our customers and the organization is kept secure. So we have actually gone through training ourselves. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. My name is Lanzel Bloomfield. I'm a shareholder. I have three questions. Page 40, note 11. Mr. Chair, please explain why your depreciation cost has gone up by 403 million over the 2015 figure of 2.87 million. You only do the questions and then we'll just answer them as well. Uh, my next question, uh, let me just add a little caveat here. I am not an IT person, but I have an interest in this company as the first IT company on the market. And I will invest in a company like this and anything that you have to invest in. So. Recently, there are some issues concerning cloud computing, and I have great concern about it. So hence this question. With a company migrating into cloud computing, how do you propose to deal with the jurisdictional matters that will arise should those servers in the foreign jurisdiction are taken down by malware or run somewhere? Okay. Do you get that, Mr. Chair? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my last question, page 59, note 5. There is an amount of some 41.355 million, which is past 30 days overdue. And a grand total of 47.151 million, which is past overdue, past the 365 days overdue. What is being done to correct this as a new company? Those are my questions. Note 11 regarding the depreciation charge. Mm -hmm. The charge for the year was actually 4 million, but the prior year charge was actually 
So it was actually an increase of 2.8 to 4 and not increasing by 4. So the, the year over year increase was actually 1.2 million. And this would have been as a result of acquisition of additional equipment for operations. Is that, that, that was answering your note 11? Your question was asked. Line item no, number 11. I uh, use the term by, but let me just correct that. You, you have moved the 2015 figure. You were at your depreciation cost. You were at 2.8 million. You are now at 4.034 million. And I'm saying, what is what has cost that for you to have a, a figure of four point um, four point zero three million? What has cost that increase? Your reference to a, a computer or some other item purchase you would not would not have come under this line item. Yeah. No, there were there were additions to the asset base that was um, that would have contributed to that based on the rate, which is stated that we use as depreciation, which is under computer and equipment. Is there any particular investment you yeah, the com that's the computer and equipment, which is a primary, um, which is one of our higher rates, which is used as a de depreciation for equipment. So it's, it's, yes, so there were, there were new workstations that were done, and there were also an expansion in regarding the, the with the, with the increase in headcount, we actually increased the office space in terms of furniture and equipment. So that addition would have led to us increasing the depreciation expense that would have been written off in the year. Okay? Um. Uh, with respect to cloud computing and jurisdictional matters, malware, ransomware, um, I'm going to comment on it and then I'm going to ask John Gibson, our senior IT security officer, to, to also add his comments. Um, what you raised there is a serious concern as to what happens when the servers that you may be, your, your data may be on are in a jurisdiction outside of the country. And the concerns are not just related to, um, you know, the, the host computers being attacked by malware or ransomware. Um, there are concerns in many organizations where computers could be, let's call it the servers, or the cloud computing service could be done out of data centers in the U.S. And those data centers then come under the Patriot Act. And as a result, there are measures that U.S. federal authorities could take. And there's a concern that although you are innocent, you have done nothing wrong, the particular servers or the data center that your data resides in actually gets, um, what do I call it, called shut down um, as a result of that. Uh, in our case, the company who we work with most closely is Microsoft. And Microsoft does has a lot of measures in place such that if something happens and a and company's information is or, or a data center is or, or sorry U.S. federal authorities request access to a company's information, uh, there's a set of steps that have to be taken before that data can be released. So Microsoft has a lot in place, and we're confident that. Um, you know that it's not going to get much better than what Microsoft does because they have so many companies that they're hosting information for. Uh, with respect to malware or ransomware, if information um, gets destroyed or compromised because of malware or ransomware, I am not sure that there are many things that an organization will be able to do unless you have some specific agreements in place with the service provider um, with relation to how they protect the, um, the equipment that they use. One thing I would say, and I'd ask John to comment on this though, is that 
even though you may provide a service in the cloud, and that doesn't mean that the cloud service provider is the only entity responsible for protecting data. Um, the company that actually, let's say I, I have a server in the cloud, I have a responsibility to ensure that the data, or sorry, the use of that server is done in a way that the data is protected. I still have to patch that server. I still have to ensure that the right security and control measures are in place. Um, and uh, and uh, I can't just leave it to the cloud service provider. Uh, so basically, what, what you can take away from that is security is not any one entity's responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility. So John, you want to just comment on security in the cloud? Thank you. Okay, um, I'll make two comments quickly. Uh, the first one, um, with regards to the, the geographic location of the data, um, a, even though the, your primary location for your data may be in the United States, a lot of these companies, they replicate the data across the world. So even if it is that the FBI or whichever agency, law enforcement agency, does decide that you know they need to go into a US data center, for argument's sake, to take equipment or to take a infrastructure offline, then your business will not cease to function because that data is replicated in Europe, it's replicated in Oceania, it's also replicated in Asia. So your business will continue to function um, where that is concerned. Uh, the second point I'll make is I'll just uh, expand on what Teddy just said a while ago in terms of your responsibility. Your, your data, your applications, your processing, whether on-premise or in the cloud, it's your responsibility. So if you move the information into the cloud, one of the things that we stress with our customers and we do practice it and enforce it with our customers is that any practice or policy that you have in place locally as, re as it regards to the security of your infrastructure, regards of, uh, as regards to the security of your data, then you take those practices to the cloud with you. The cloud is simply um, a data center that is somewhere else. So whatever you are doing, if the servers were inside your office, we, we practice those very same things when the, when the data and the servers and the applications are in the cloud. As we had mentioned before that the growth in receivables resulted, the growth in our revenues resulted in an increase in our accounts receivables. T-Tech actually does its billing at the end of, uh, end, of an, end of each month. As a result, our receivables are always higher at the end of each month. The past due amounts, which you mentioned between 30, in excess of 31 days, um, re represents 12% of our balances. At the present moment, management is monitoring the portfolio. We're in dialogue with our customers and we are collecting. We have no disputes. We have met with our customers and they have agreed that the balances are collectible. They have owned them and we, are in, we continue to maintain that dialogue and collections as we speak. Mr. Chairman, um, thank you very much. Um, and congrats on the elevation to the stock exchange. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sir. I'm intrigued by the company. Uh, some questions and some suggestions, or one or two suggestions. Um, one of the question has to do with the, it's an area I'm a little bit disappointed in, and I'm not sure that in your commentary in with the release of the results you have spoken to it in a in the most eloquent way um, and i'm putting it that way maybe i'm i'm, I'm not um, expressing the thing correctly but the 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 rise in the labor cost um has not been or well it, it, last year, for a period, the, the addition of human resources um, grew at, maybe not faster than, but certainly grew um, to significantly negate the revenue growth, the strong revenue growth that you had last year. Um, and certainly for the first quarter of this year, one has not seen the payoff in terms of a stronger growth in, in gross profit. I mean, one understands last year when you were taking on staff that you take on staff, they have to become acclimatized to the culture, and in some cases, 
they may be relatively green and you have to train them to be able to do the task you have at hand. What I've not seen spoken to very eloquently is, yes, I hear about the services in strong demand. Um, I can't, well, a criticism I have of the financial statements, everything is pretty much lumped into admin cost apart from finance. So one can't separate the persons who are dealing directly with the revenue earning as opposed to those people who are pushing pens behind the scenes. So I would strongly recommend that management seriously look at separating the admin people from the, from the direct um, operating persons so that one can get a sense as to what is happening on the gross profit. So one is in a better position to, certainly for myself, try and get a sense as to what the future may look like. At the moment, it's very difficult. It's essentially, you have used the clouded thing to, to, um, to <laughs> the clouded the cloud is, 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 is disguising what is really taking place in the organization. And um, people outside can't, well, so people like myself. And it's, I don't want to have to, we shouldn't have to call management to find out what the, what the true facts are. Uh, when it comes to something like that. That's normal and should be, it should be presented in that way. The auditors should have presented it in that way as well um, in terms of the finance. Well, they should have ensured that these figures are so represented. Um, so I recommend strongly that with the next quarterly results, we get, we try and get a breakout of so those direct costs and those non-direct costs. Um, but I also recommend, and you can tell us here, what is happening on the revenue side versus the cost side. Uh, because to date, we have not seen the breakout of revenue, which I expected by now, we start to see revenues really significantly outpacing the cost. Uh, <clears throat> a suggestion is in for, the, for next year's or this year's, and you do the next year's, this year's results, that you also incorporate a summary of the quarterly results, either in the MDNA or with it, just to give shareholders and investors already access to information, um, other than us going back to looking at, at the information. So one can better, you can comment on that in the MDNA to, to relate it to what the final outturn is. Um, the amount of shares that were issued publicly, I think, was 25 million shares. And I think with the, with the performance of the company and I think the desire for some people to be related to the, the sector, um, I suspect more and more persons are, in fact, acquiring shares and retaining them. Um, the overall share capital is not particularly large. And, and, and therefore, I mean, what I tell my other investors is that the cheapest form of publicity that the company can get is listing on the stock exchange. And management, as far as I'm concerned, need to extract as much as they can extract from that listing. And one way to do that is to ensure that the shares are at a level that will trade almost every day. So you're getting daily exposure of the company. I'm sure no doubt you have already seen the benefits that come from, from the listing, as well as from the, the fact that the shares trade regularly. I believe you may be getting the stock, maybe getting to a level, and you're going to make it worse because you say you're going to be buying shares for staff where liquidity, if you look at the, the trading platform of the stock exchange, currently you have very few shares. I don't think you have active, what I call actively posted on the exchange for sale. I, I don't think there are 20,000 shares offered for sale at any price, with between $8 and 50, whatever the price is. And there are a range of prices. So today at the close of trading, the lowest offer is $9 for a relatively small amount. So that what I'm suggesting is 
something that a lot of people have done and I believe junior market companies seriously ought to get more liquidity into the stock and the way to get it obviously is by splitting the stock so that and each time you get some most stocks are around five six dollars um, you probably want to try and do whatever is necessary in the medium term two or three years to keep the price somewhere under ten dollars and then you then have to anticipate what the performance of the company is likely to be and what the stock price is likely to be in the future to see whether you're going to wait until next year to, if you want to do a stock split, maybe the management might decide they want a stock of 20 or $30. Um, but I would recommend that some consideration be given to improve the liquidity of the stock um, and make more, well, people obviously like stock splits, as you can see, all companies that have stock splits are announced them. Um, the share prices have gone up significantly. Um, so that's my recommendation. Um, so those are the those are the, the, the issues that I raise and, and wish that you will will perform deliver some outstanding performances in the quarters to come. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, John. Um, and some good points made, and certainly things that we will have to take under consideration at the board. The issue of the liquidity, so on. Um, I've, I'll speak to um, the concerns about efficiencies and labor costs. I'm going to ask Chris Record, who is our sales and marketing director, um, to comment on what we're doing with respect to uh, the top line, the revenue side, um, particularly for this year. Um, but uh, regarding the liquidity, I, I think it's fair to say it, it's a very good point and it's something that we have to consider. Stock obviously is in demand and we need to create opportunities for trading to take place. Um, the summary of the quarter results in the MDNA, that's something we definitely can look at for next year's annual report, and thank you for that suggestion. And also, comment about the true cost of sale, um, you know, separating, I guess, direct operating costs for provision of services from admin, which is more overhead. Yeah, that's something that we can look at uh, with the auditors. I I could not commit to doing it for the next quarter's results, <laughs> um, but certainly it is something that we look at, see what's required to do it, and um, quite possibly maybe it might be something we do for the next, in the, okay, so um, next result. Uh, regarding efficiencies and, sorry. Something is better than nothing at all. Whether you incorporate it in the formal, if you don't feel that the figures, I mean, the accountant should be able to determine who are the people who are in and the various items of cost that are directly related. I know it's a little bit late in the day, but you should be able, even if you can't get it formally in the quarterly numbers themselves, at least give some indication in your commentary as to what you think. You, know, you can say, well, it's been worked on, but preliminary, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. So one can get a better appreciation as to what is happening. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, fine, thanks. Um, regarding uh, efficiencies and labor costs, um, it is true that during the course of 2016, we were you know, increasing headcount, taking people on. Um, uh, we were very conscious of that. And um, you know, if you look back on the the CEO's reports uh, in the quarters last year, there were comments made about investing in tools and so on. So in my presentation earlier, I spoke about new remote monitoring and management tools. Those are now in place, and you know, we're seeing the, the benefits of that. Uh, I'll give you an example, what we call onboarding a customer. We acquire a new customer, and they want us to come in and take over the management of their infrastructure. Typically, that would have required, I would say, a couple of weeks of work. Um, today, we can actually do that in a manner of a couple of days. The deployment of the the the, the call it the, the software that we put on the the client's machines uh, can also be done remotely. 
the monitoring of the health of the computers at the client site, um, inclusive of how vulnerable they are to threats such as ransomware, is all done remotely. Customers have a problem, we can log into their computers remotely and so on. So we are using these tools you know, to uh, support our customers today and we continue to look for ways to improve efficiencies. But that was the, the major initiative during the course of 2016 to try and ensure that um, you know, we could actually just improve the efficiency of our operations associated with the services. There's also some work done on the security side um, in terms of uh, uh, reporting or assessment when we do the vulnerability assessments of our customers' computers. Um, it used to be a manual process in terms of going through the reports. Um, we invested in some software that we had someone develop for us that actually now gets the results and Johnny just feeds it in and we're able to get the reports so fairly automated. Um, the analysis, you know, the review of the reports obviously still requires the expertise of someone like a John or members of his team, but the production of the reports has been uh, improved significantly. So John, we, we are very conscious of the fact that um, these things need to happen. Um, we have other members of the team working on other areas. There are many small internal processes um, that are benefiting from what we call scripting where instead of somebody doing step A, step B, step C, step C, step D, we actually write a small program that we call a script and it will automate that entire process. Uh, so those are things that we're, we're also working on and that's an ongoing process. Okay? So. Yeah. Um, the, the measurement that we use in house is what we call the number of endpoints or nodes that can be supported by, uh, by a full time person. Uh, so, for instance, I, I don't have the targets on top of my head, and Norman Chen, who is our technical services director, unfortunately, isn't here. But we have targets that we set that say, all right, um, we should be able to manage, for argument's sake, 400 nodes per person uh, who is involved in that direct support work. So there are targets that we strive towards to ensure, and that is how we measure the efficiency internally as to how well we're doing with respect to the, the, the actual services being provided. Okay. Metric? Yes, those, uh, those are metrics that we do track. Um, those are, uh, what you call it, we do look at them uh, on a quarterly basis, um, you know, at the board meeting level. Um, we are not where we'd like to be this year um, because our revenues haven't been at the levels that we would like to. So. What I'm going to do is maybe ask Chris to comment now <laughs> on what we're doing to, to get those numbers up uh, to be now in the end of the year. Okay. So John, last year and the year before, we were doing um, a fair amount of what, 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 what our team would call net fishing. And we threw out a lot of nets, went after a lot of different markets, just to feel out the need that was out there in the market. And uh, there, was, there was great success. We had um, successes on the on the on you know, PBX sales and also on all the service areas in terms of remote monitoring and management for servers uh, and all that. At the beginning of this year, um, we took a decision to do a little bit more focused marketing. Um, so we threw out the net and started doing some spear phishing. And the spear phishing has been, been a little slower than anticipated because what we're going after, we're going after some bigger fish. And um, when, when we're going and have meetings with these, uh, with these organizations, the decisions for these bigger projects take a lot longer. Um, you know, we internally joke around as to one of our most successful sales literally took us almost a year and a half 
Um, you know, it was a b big project, but at one point in time, we stopped hearing from the customer altogether. We thought it was dead. And then one day, a guy just called us back and said, well, you know, I mean, we're, we're shocked. Uh, went back in and signed and delivered the project, and everybody was happy. So right now, what we're doing, we have um, we have ramped up our spear fishing. We have added more spears. <laughs> um, you know, so we stopped, you know, we stopped the shotgun shooting and shooting with rifles. And so we have a situation right now where we are on the road very, very actively um, following up on a lot of the opportunities that um, while well, this has been in pipeline for a while, uh, when we check back with the customers, uh, you know, they said, look, we haven't made a decision yet, and we, we, we internally are taking long because we do have some situations where customers have said to us that we definitely want this. You're the one selected, but wait until the last quarter, wait until next quarter. So we do have a pipeline with some, with a few promises like that. Um, so our, our team is small. Um, all three of us are right here. It's, you know, Marcel, Oren, and myself that, um, that hit the road. And we um, we're right now very busy. I mean, every single day this week, we have been in front of customers, um, say for today. I mean, today, this morning on the phone, but we didn't visit any today because we're preparing here. But for this month and for next month, um, we are we, we have a few things very very close to closing, and it's um it's just it's just boots on the ground. It's it's back to regular old sales, filling the pipeline, and we're very busy and as I said, with lots of promises. So. Um, I promised I promised the chair and I promised uh, the CEO that the end of this year we'd look, we'll be looking very favorable. That's all I can tell them right now. I can't, I can't, I can't give you any full little details, John. Don't ask for any details. Can't divulge any details here. <laughs> yes. Okay, so most of the most of the opportunities we're looking at, I mean the services opportunities, they're not they're not you know product. So there's uh, when I say input, I'm assuming you mean cost of goods. No, no, people. People. Okay. 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 Well, right at this moment, we don't need to employ any more people to handle that. Those those opportunities that we are that we are, that we are chasing and that are, that are close to closing. Um, again, you know, being in a growth mode um, right now, you know, the, 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 the team that joined, the, the, as you as you rightfully said earlier, they, you know, they take a while to come up to speed to understand our processes and our methodologies. Um, most of them have, and um, and yeah, those those are the ones that are going to be delivering delivering the, the, the opportunities and services we're working on right now. Right. <laughs> the human resources, yes. Uh, yeah. human the team, team is in place. Uh -huh. um, how much more revenues can you get out of them? Um, I don't think we have, <laughs> we have done analysis like that, Teddy. Um, let me, let me I, I can't give you a figure, John. What I do know is that uh, there's actually a fair amount of capacity in terms of us being able to support more customers, more users in a steady state mode. Um, with all IT activities, whether it's the services we provide or whether customers are implementing new software and so on, what you tend to see is that at the time of a change, there's a spike in the resource needs. So what happens is when we take over a customer, there's actually a, a spike in terms of our own internal needs uh, to be able to manage the transition from you know, the customer managing themselves versus us managing for them. Uh, one of the ways we seek to mitigate that is using the project managers and the consulting team so that they can go in and help to manage the activities associated uh, with that transition. Um, and try quickly get the customer to a point where it's more steady state and we're not changing too many things. Once we get to steady state mode, then um, they, they we actually have a lot of capacity there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The revenues generated last year was 223 two, 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 um, and um, so the revenue 
per staff member declined that to soon, very difficult. 2015. Mm -hmm. I would assume so. So the, the question really is, with the existing staff, mm -hmm. how much more revenues relative to the 2023? Uh, that, that's a bit of a, of a looking glass because some of that revenue and certainly you know what we're looking at for 2017 would also have been coming from consulting where as I indicated previously we actually take subcontractors on um, you know to to, uh, to 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 move there um, I, I, I if I, I could put a number out but quite honestly John I'll just be and I don't want to do that. I yes, I quite am. What what I suggest is let let's take. I think I'm quite happy to follow up with you if um you know outside of this. I just have to go back and look at some of the information that we have uh, to be able to get back to you. All right. Okay. <laughs> if no other questions, um, thank you very much, everyone, for the interest and the questions. Um, I now want to put the resolution one to the meeting for adoption, just to remind you that it's that the audited accounts for the year ended December 31st, 2016, together with the director's report and auditor's report there on B and are hereby adopted. We had already had the, mo um, the motion proposed and seconded, so it's now those in favor for the adoption? Any against? Okay, so it's been adopted. Thank you. The next item is the appointment of the auditors. Messrs. Ernst and Young of 8 Olivier Road, Kingston 8, have agreed to continue as the auditors of the company. May I have a proposal and a second for resolution number two, which is that Messrs. Ernst and Young be reappointed auditors of the company in accordance with section 154 of the 2004 Companies Act and that their remuneration be fixed by the directors for the ensuing year. A proposal, Mr. Bloomfield, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Those in favor? Aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Resolution is carried. Next item is the re election of directors. Pursuant to Article 102 of the company's Articles of Incorporation, the retiring directors eligible for re election are Edward Alexander and Hugh Allen. May I have a shareholder to propose resolution 4A, which is that retiring director Edward Alexander B and is hereby re-elected a director of the company proposal. Okay, second. Thank you. Um, I put now put the resolution to the meeting. Those in favor? Aye. Any against? Thank you. Motion passed. Welcome back, Mr. Alexander. <laughs> um, may I have a shareholder to propose resolution, propose and second resolution 4B, which is that retiring director Hugh Allen B and is hereby re-elected a director of the company. Proposer, John Gibson. Seconded. Seconded. Mr. Rose. Thank you. Put resolution to the meeting. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the business of the meeting. Um, I'd again like to thank you all for coming and thank you, the investing public, for the confidence you have shown in the company. And can, you know, I really look forward to many years of success. I'd also like to thank my board for the support they gave me throughout the year and uh, the guidance they've given the company. And a very, very special thank you to the team, the T Tech team, who not only, you know, give insanely good customer service, but I think are insanely good themselves. Thank you very much.